first simple secret to successful cybersecurity is not putting all of your eggs into one basket, which most of us learn from fairy tales or from stories told to us by our parents. Simple idea. If you put all your stuff in one place and something bad happens in that one place, something bad just happened to all of your stuff. A switch from eggs to a bag of Halloween candies to further illustrate our point. In the US today, most candies that come in a bag for Halloween are individually wrapped. That protects all of the other candies against someone reaching in with dirty hands to grab just one or the candies from becoming inedible if the open bag gets spilled on the floor. Protection is simple when each candy can defend itself. So, a big part of what our technologies do is wrap the individual candies, data, apps, or snippets of a video, for example. Because protection gets very complicated, as you know from reading every day in the newspaper about massive data breaches, if you put unprotected individual candies in bigger and bigger bags simply to save the effort and expense of building the bag. Which is what IBM, CA, and most of the cybersecurity technologies you know tried to do. Their system might work great until someone with greasy hands gets into the bag. Then, of course, everything in that bag is spoiled. Our second great secret to successful cybersecurity is making sure things don't do bad stuff in their natural state. Consider the fact that a modern clothes iron turns itself off when it has been upright for a few moments. What we call the native state of the iron is turned off and cool, in other words safe, and when anything goes wrong the iron returns to that state. If the surface of the iron gets too hot, it turns itself off. If it is left on while not being used for too long, it turns itself off. If the power goes off while the iron is on, an interlock keeps the iron from turning back on when the power comes back on. So the native state of a clothes iron is safe. Computer data should be the same. In its native state, the harmful things in it should not be readable. In other words, they should be safe. When the data is not in legitimate use or when things go wrong, the data should return to its native or safe state where the data cannot be read. And like the clothes iron's production of steam or heat, data should only be readable for the short periods of time it is in actual use. And that is the second major component of what our technologies do. Everything we touch is born and lives its entire life safe in its natural state, which we call enciphered. And we expose unsafe views of that protected thing specific to a stated purpose only as needed and when everything in the environment says it's okay to do so. Even then, we show that view only for the brief period of time it is needed. Sadly, almost no other software, except maybe at NASA or in certain oil field situations where we work for decades to learn this second simple secret, has adopted this basic technique. For example, if you write your social security number in a text editor like Microsoft Notepad, everybody gaining access to that file can see your social security number exactly as you wrote it. In other words, that notepad file is the opposite of safe in its native state. Our technologies fix all of that. Let's look at our third secret to cybersecurity success, ET Phone Home. Not so very long ago, your favorite jean store counted its inventory as few times a year as they possibly could. Counting inventory was painful because you had to do it when the store was closed either late at night or on holidays. You couldn't do it while customers were moving things around because it took so long. You had to straighten out all the stacks first so you didn't miss a pair crumpled up behind, and if during the inventory a pair was found in the wrong size stack, you had to scramble to adjust counts. Of course, there was human error and cheating. Then along came those little RFID tags, the ones that remove at the counter with their scanner when you make a purchase, and all those inventory problems magically disappeared overnight. Those RFID tags allow each pair of jeans to report its own information about itself when you ask, no matter where they may be hidden or what stack they may be in. Now the shopkeeper can do complete accurate inventories in minutes, even with customers in the store, no special training or care required. One of the components of our technologies is like RFID tags, except on steroids. Because we are protecting the individual data items anyway, we enable them to not only respond to questions, but to call out when something unusual happens. Certainly nothing the big boys are offering allow individual data items to report their own problems. As to our fourth simple secret, it only makes sense not to follow bad guys into dark alleys they know and you don't. You always want to be one step ahead of a hacker, not one step behind him and following him or her around. Yet most cybersecurity technologies are nothing more than that, reacting way late to what the bad guy did and then following him into an unlit back alley the hacker knows well, hoping they can win the fight that ensues. The classic examples are virus and malware scanners, which take 90 days to 6 months after the malware or virus is discovered to write test, release, and distribute a prevention for it they hope will work. By that time, the virus's impact has already peaked naturally anyway. You'll hear other technologies screaming threat detection or threat vector analysis. That is how that vendor says we have no clue how to prevent you from being attacked or the hacker getting in the door, but once he's in and doing damage we can tell you he's here, sort of like a hacker butler or doorman. At that point, the hacker is already in the door, we assume he's not stupid, and we also assume he has options to do other things to get around anything they can stop him from doing. Our technologies stop all of this in its tracks by making sure there's nothing for the hacker to get. Every single piece of valuable data is independently and multiply enciphered and it is too much work to try to decipher. 
We'll talk more about this when we describe our sixth cybersecurity secret. For our fifth cybersecurity secret, you never want to refight the last war you were in. My favorite story from history in that regard is that of the Maginot Line. The Maginot Line was an impressive string of enforced towers, walls, and fortifications the French put up between themselves and the Germans after the First World War, guaranteed to stop anything the Germans had in 1918. The problem with that design was, of course, that in 1918, the Germans didn't have the Panzer tank or two decades to survey the weaknesses of the Maginot Line, both of which made short work of crossing it in May 1940. And so IBM, CA, FireEye, and all the rest continue to fight and egregiously lose the last war. One of the most concerning ways that they do that is in the constant emphasis on ever more sophisticated forms of encryption. Any hacker worth his salt knows how to get around encryption not by trying to beat it, but by letting it complete its work all the way through to the end. Then they steal the deciphered results. Don't get me wrong, we have our own encryption innovations of which we are quite proud. We invented encryption that doesn't use public keys of any kind that can be stolen, forgotten, or hacked, and never produces the same enciphered result twice in a row even when using the same inputs. But while encryption can certainly be a tool used in the solution, it is most certainly not the answer by any means. Everyone in this business, hacker and professional alike, understands or should understand that the problem with the encryption is that everything then has to be decrypted somewhere, and that it is trivial to identify that somewhere and take the deciphered result from there. You should check out the online videos showing how car thieves, high school dropouts at best, get around key fob encryption to steal modern automobiles. It happens that we solved that problem with our code cocoon technology, but had we not done that, encryption in and of itself is of very little value except in combination with other things. Yet, knowing this, the industry hypes the encryption anyway because they know the general public believes it has more value than it actually does. Especially when the intelligence services of every major country, including our own NSA, have forced backdoors into the source code to all known forms of traditional encryption. But that last cybersecurity war was with hackers working solo from their mom's basements purely for purposes of harassment against file servers. Today's hackers are well-coordinated, well-paid professionals armed with source code stolen from the NSA, working as teams for nation states like China, North Korea, and Russia. Yet these vendors keep doing the most foolish thing you could do in the face of this new kind of threat, piling ever larger collections of data onto even bigger server farms and clouds. These are protected by the same vendor software with exploits well known to, and sold and published by, hackers on the dark net, where they become even more tempting and obvious targets for well-funded hacker consortiums. Of course, with our technology, we went all guerrilla warfare on the hackers, making every single data item uniquely enciphered in several ways. That renders any kind of mass theft impossible, and therefore the effort not worthy of their very expensive time. Which segues nicely to our last, and my personal favorite, sixth cybersecurity secret. The best way to protect your stuff is to make every single valuable thing much more trouble than it is worth to steal. If there's a whole bunch of valuable stuff behind a wall that is otherwise unprotected, that's a lot of incentive for someone to figure out how to climb that wall. That's true regardless how much barbed wire is piled on top of it. It doesn't help any that in building a massive wall with piles of barbed wire heaped on it, you've just advertised in a big way to the world at large or something quite valuable behind it. But if the most a thief can ever gain from a difficult criminal act is one little piece of data, you've definitely given him pause. And if to gain more data, he'll have to engage in a whole lot of equally difficult yet unique criminal acts where his risk of getting caught increases exponentially with each act, you could call that disincentive. Add the fact he's going to have to spend effort to find anything of valuable steal in the first place because there's no massive wall advertising a big collection of things, and you've effectively discouraged any hacking attempt in the first place, not to mention having reduced any likelihood of success to virtually zero. The bottom line is really quite simple. If you uniquely and aggressively secure each and every individual data item of value, you stop virtually all hacking in its tracks and the need for any other protection goes completely away. So now you know how to design successful cybersecurity software, and if it weren't for those pesky patents and applications we already have, you could write your own versions of sir 2 digital software. But we're not quite done with our little story. Once you have mastered these six basic secrets and written and patented the fundamental pieces to implement them, you can use them as building blocks to build some cool things that aren't so basic. Things like dynamic modification control, obfuscated viewing to prevent and track screen and audio captures, including with an analog camera, and allowing different stakeholders to have a voice and allowing access to a piece of data. But the coolest thing you can do that nobody else in the world can do is turn individual pieces of data on and off based on things a computer can see and test in its environment at the time access to that data is requested. Things a computer can see include its GPS location, the time of day, who else is on the computer, what other apps and files are on the device, and what was the user doing recently. Thousands of things, but it gets even better. Because now that you can do that, now you can also effectively enforce the basic ideas behind Western intellectual property law. 
That law says for decades after creation, you get to say who can use the novel ideas that you have expressed in your writings, your music, your videos, your art, and in captures of your performances. The author of intellectual property uses our technology to tell that data not to play unless everything meets the author's conditions when the play request is made. The author's conditions can be something like, do I know this person? Or was I paid for playing this song? Or is the person making the request in the US? Or how many times was this game played before? The conditions can be as loose or as restrictive as the author wants, and he can change them at any time. He can even choose to be informed whenever anything about the use of his intellectual property isn't quite right for some reason. Any of those things that are digital, a file, a photo, a video, an image, or an app, can be protected anywhere they go, on any device they can be found, on any server they can be stored, on any network they can be transmitted, by the creator or owner for the rest of their existence, or until their many years of rights expire. This is also true of any copies ever made automatically. And by protect, yes, we mean ensuring that the writers, artists, musicians, content providers, and developers get paid for their work.